che tu ci vuoi conoscere attraverso i raggi X eccetera, che cosa, la composizione che cosa c'è eh, credo che questo sia uno dei, degli aspetti che ha sempre mosso la, diciamo, la ricerca dell'uomo, l'uomo se non avesse fatto ricerca non, avrebbe, non sarebbe mai in finale l'abbiamo fatta questa ricerca come dire cercandoci, cercandoci nuove, nuove frontiere ma spesso frontiere che non erano non soltanto geografiche, adesso le frontiere geografiche si sono allungate, possiamo arrivare a, a andare ad analizzare quello che succede su altri pianeti e questo credo che ehm, ci darà moltissime informazioni su chi siamo, dove, da dove, dove andiamo, da, da dove veniamo e dove andiamo. Credo che questa sia un po' la grande domanda che tutti noi ci facciamo. Allora, io um, do subito la parola al professor Bisch che non credo che abbia bisogno di presentazione, tutti voi sapete di chi è, e lo ringrazio di essere venuto qui, ringrazio il Dipartimento di Scienze della Terra, credo che noi abbiamo come, dire, come parassiti utilizzato l'opportunità di avere il professor Bisci qua per poi invitarlo a fare questa conferenza, ma il suo lavoro veramente è con i dipartimenti, con il Dipartimento vostro, eh, mi ha appena spiegato che si fermerà qui una quindicina. Buonasera. Un momentino. Signore e signori, è un piacere per me visitare Napoli ancora una volta. Ho visitato Napoli nel 1997 e l'ho visitata molte volte da allora per vedere i miei cari amici. Mi scuso se non parlo bene l'italiano, ma cercherò per il momento. È stato un grande privilegio partecipare alla missione My Science Laboratory. Questa missione è uno dei grandi successi tecnologici del XXI secolo e permette di aumentare notevolmente la nostra comprensione di Marte, della sua geologia, dell'atmosfera e sulla possibilità che abbia mai ospitato la vita. Il rover Curiosity è stato anche recentemente nominato invenzione dell'anno dal Time Magazine. Mi scuserete, ma io penso di parlare in inglese ora. <laughs> Parlo inglese? <laughs> so, it's a, is it indeed a great pleasure to be here in such a beautiful setting in Napoli again, to tell you about the very exciting time that I've had working on the Mars Science Laboratory mission. It's really for a scientist, sorry, I'm supposed to stay up here. For a scientist, it's the, the opportunity of a lifetime uh, to participate in this mission. So I hope I can tell you some things to translate this excitement to you tonight. Uh-oh. <laughs> ah, there. So, for those people in the audience who have been reading the newspapers, you may not know that we have been studying Mars for many, many years. And in fact, some of the earliest studies of Mars go back to Italian scientists. Um, you've probably heard of Canali on Mars. And these Canali were first observed by Pietro Secchi over 100 years ago, an Italian astronomer. And they were actually described a year later by Giovanni Scaparetti as being Canali. And a few years later, Percival Lowell 
suggested that these were actually canals that were built by an intelligent race of people to transport water from melting ice at the poles to crops at the equator. So there's been interest in Mars for many, many years. What have we done since Secchi's first studies over 100 years ago? We've sent a number of missions to Mars, and right now we have many observations that were based on the Earth using telescope. We have a number of orbiters circling Mars, and several different landers have actually landed on Mars since the 1970s. Most of these observations were photographic. So you know we have many beautiful images of the surface of Mars. Some were what we call spectral. And so they gave us some idea of the kind of materials on the surface of Mars. But even until a few months ago, we had no direct information on what we geologists call mineralogy. Mineralogy means what minerals are present on the surface. And I'll, I will give you an example later about this. This is, mineralogy is important to geologists because it opens the history to us. It opens the history of the planet. Geologists study minerals in rocks on the Earth because it tells us what has happened on Earth. We want to do the same thing on Mars. And Curiosity, Curiosity is the rover. It has provided us just a couple of weeks ago with the first direct mineralogy information ever obtained on the surface of Mars. Before I begin with that, just a brief bit of information about the geologic time scale on Mars. Mars is about the same age as Earth, which is about 4.5 billion years old. And this is the, the traditional geologic time scale for Mars, showing what is called the Noachian, the Hesperian, and the Amazonian. You can see the Noachian period extended from 4.5 billion years to 3.6 billion years ago. And it's interesting, most of the surface that we see on Mars today formed in this period. So it's a very important difference between Mars and Earth. Most of the surface that we see on the Earth today was formed very recently, it would be in this region. So Mars is very, very different from Earth. And we can have a picture by looking at the surface of Mars of the geology from the very distant past. As I mentioned, there have been a number of missions that have landed on Mars, and it may surprise you to know that as far back as the 1970s, we sent the Viking 1 and 2 landers to Mars. They were actually very sophisticated. They did not drive, but they landed and they had scientific instruments, and we obtained a lot of information. Since that time, we sent the Opportunity rover. Recently, we had the, rather, the Pathfinder. The Opportunity and Spirit were the Mars exploration rovers that have traveled for many years. It's, those were very exciting missions because they were planned to last only for one month. And one of them is still going after seven years. So they've been, they've been built very well. And recently, the Phoenix lander studied terrain near the pole, near the North Pole of Mars. The mission I will tell you about today, which is called the Mars Science Laboratory mission, landed in Gale Crater. So you can see that it's, it's far from most of the other places that we've ever studied. Just briefly, the scientific goal of the Curiosity rover is pretty simple, but very ambitious. It's to explore and study the Gale Crater region as a potential habitat for past or present day life. 
it's a, it's a big mission, but really, in a way, it's very simple. It requires some complex instruments. What we want to look at, and what we have been looking at now for about three months, is whether there's the potential for biological life. We want to learn more about the role of water. This may seem like a simple thing, but life requires water, and most of the Mars surface is very dry. We are going to study the geology, and the mineralogy, and the geochemistry. And there are several instruments on the rover that study, for example, surface radiation and the weather to tell us more about potential habitability, whether humans might go there someday in the future. Here's a quick overview of the mission itself. The mission launched just about one year ago, November 26, 2011, on actually a pretty small rocket. It's called an Atlas V rocket. I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. It took eight months to travel to Mars, and it arrived late in the evening of August 5th. For you, it would be in the morning of August 6th. It had a very complicated landing procedure. And I'll, I have a picture of that for you, but it involved going through, slowing down through Mars atmosphere, Mars does have an atmosphere, releasing a parachute that slowed it down more, and then deploying a rocket system called a sky crane that lowered the Curiosity rover to the ground. It, it's by far the most complicated landing system ever devised. And I know many of you who I've talked to watched one of the videos discussing the danger of the landing. And it was because of this complexity that it was very, very dangerous. Many people thought it wouldn't work. We were, we were very relieved. So the mission on the surface, now that it's successfully on the ground, will last about two Earth years or about one Mars year. And unlike all of the rovers that were on Mars in the past, this Curiosity rover is nuclear powered and not solar powered. So it can operate, for example, in the night. This is a picture, it's actually an image taken from orbit of Gale Crater. It's an ancient crater formed by an impact of a meteor. And in the center is something called Mount Sharp. Mount Sharp is five kilometers higher than the surrounding region. So it's a very large change in elevation. Curiosity landed just in here and will over the next two years travel across to sample the geologic strata, the layers of rock that make up the central part of this crater. This is 15 the seconds. Enjoy. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, a rather one. The launch. Sorry. Main engine start, <laughs> zero, and liftoff of the Atlas V with curiosity. See concludes to the planetary puzzle about life on Mars. Members of the, the science team were invited to the launch and with their families. And so there were many, many people at Cape Canaveral, Florida, watching the launch. And my family and I visited. And it was a, a very exciting and, and moving time. And it was so nice to see our instrument that we had worked on for perhaps 20 years finally start on its voyage to Mars. So it was a, a wonderful time. This is the, a picture of the Curiosity rover with a list of all of the instruments on it. Um, there are 10 instruments. If you count these, you will see 11 things. The drill and scoop are not counted as instruments. But it's got a very large number of instruments, the most complex rover. The, my instrument is known as Kemin. 
for chemistry and mineralogy, and I'll tell you more about that in a minute. And I will also tell you a few things about some of the results from the other instruments. So we've launched Curiosity towards Mars. Most of the instruments are sleeping. They're not operating. But one of the instruments operated as we flew to Mars. The instrument is called RAD for Radiation Assessment Detector. And it measures the radiation environment in space on the way to Mars. And it's, it's something that we, we have very little information about this. And it's very interesting to look at this plot. This is essentially radiation dose. And notice that here we go from 1 to 10 to 100. So each time is a factor of 10 as a function of time from launch to landing. And you can see a few times when there was a very high radiation dose. And usually this was due to solar flares. You may hear of, of solar flare, solar energetic particle events, but solar flare, we hear about these on Earth because they disrupt communications. But if you were an astronaut on a mission to Mars, you probably wouldn't want to be on the spacecraft at these times. So this is the kind of information that we want to learn before we send people into space for long distances. If we go to the moon, it's very different because we're protected by the Earth's magnetic and, and, ionic, and ionosphere. We're also now continuing to operate this. And on the surface of Mars, when we have a solar flare, a short time later, we can see the radiation from that. So we've traveled to Mars. It's August, and we're about to begin our landing. And this is a diagram showing you how it landed. <clears throat> the, the spacecraft flew to Mars, and it begins to lose some of the pieces that it flew with because it doesn't need them for landing. It starts to come into the atmosphere. The atmosphere is very thin, but it's, there is enough atmosphere to cause heating by friction. You know if you have seen a, a meteor fall through the sky that it's very bright. You see a bright trail. And this is from frictional heating. The meteor burns up often before it reaches the ground. The same kind of thing happens on Mars. The nice thing is that this friction slows curiosity down. So it begins to slow down. At some point, it releases a parachute. And at this point, it's still going faster than the speed of sound. So it's a very strong parachute. This slows the spacecraft considerably. It, as we came here, it's very, very hot. So we had a heat shield. This is the heat shield that's dropped away. We don't need the heat shield. We're, we're going slow enough. And then, at some point, this piece separates from the rover and the sky crane. And the sky crane has rocket engines that lowers the rover down to the ground. I'll show you a picture of this in a minute. In fact, right now. So this is a simulation. It's not real. It's frictional heating as it enters the atmosphere. It has the ability to control its direction because we want it to land just in the right place. The parachute is deployed. Next, there goes the heat shield. We don't need it anymore. This is the rover hiding underneath. Again, now we don't need the parachute. It goes away and, and crashes. And the rockets control the direction and the altitude of the rover, gradually approaching the surface until it lowers the rover on steel cables. You can see why we were all very nervous before the landing. It's incredible. <coughs> The minute it touches, the rockets fly away, to crash somewhere far away, and it's ready.
This is not a simulation. This is real video. One of the instruments, you can read this while I speak, and maybe it will help, to un help you to understand. One of the instruments actually took a movie. The thrusters have been re enabled. Uh, we will control our attitude on shoot. We are decelerating. Wrist mode under our carriage. There's the heat shield. The heat shield just dropped away. Now we can see. The rover is actually descending. Again with wrist mode dynamics. This is mission control. Wrist mode is nominal. We are now thrusters and heat mode is active. Valid range. So we're on the parachute, ascending on the parachute. We've acquired the ground with the radar. Now to the eight kilometers. Vigil has separated. We've found the ground. Tones due to earth occultation as expected. He will tell us. We're using by to prime the Emily engines in preparation for powered flight. He'll tell us when the engines, when the rocket. We're down to 90 meters per second at an altitude of 6.5 kilometers ascending. When the rocket engines fire, he will tell us. So it's still on the parachute. These are some sand, We've got some sand dunes. <laughs> it is in battle mode, so it should power through. Director of communications at this time. We may have lost it already. We're down to 86 meters per second at an altitude of 4 kilometers in descending. We have lost, act we've lost tones from Earth at this time. This is expected. Uh, We're continuing on Odyssey telemetry. Ground solution equals minus 10.8 meters, vertical velocity of minus 80.8 meters per second. We are priming power satellite start enabled, standing by for batch separation. Signal Odyssey is still strong. We are in powered flight. Powered flight. So the rockets now have turned on. The parachute is going away. So the rocket engines are now taking the air down to 50 meters per second. You will see in the minute a lot of dust flying from the rocket engines. It was not. It was not expected. Constant velocity accordion nominal. Altitude error 5.9 meters. We found a nice flight. See the dust. We're coming in ready for sky. The cramp. dust is flying. So it's very close. 10 meters per second. 40 meters altitude. 40 meters. This is a rocket engine. Sky crane is it, it can guide the rover to just the right Sending place. At about 0.75 meters per second as expected. Expecting final cut shortly. Signal oh <laughs> does. He remains strong. You will hear their reaction when they say it's on the ground safely. Oh. It's so close now you can't see from the dust. Yeah. Uh, you do a calm configuration. Very stable. Stable. I was there good, Jeff, good. when this happened. Touchdown confirmed. We're safe. Touchdown. <laughs> so, <laughs> safely on the ground. It was uh, a, an incredible moment. Um, I was there with a large group of scientists on the mission, and it was one of the best moments, better than the launch. This is an incredible picture. We, as I mentioned, we had a number of, of satellites orbiting Mars, most of them taking pictures. They, they take incredible pictures. Some of them could take a picture of your car very easily from, from orbit. And this is a picture that was captured as Curiosity descended on the parachute. You can see the parachute and Curiosity hanging beneath it. And if you, we blow it up, that's the kind of images that we can obtain from orbit. So it was a very lucky image to catch. This is a picture taken not very long after it landed, showing it's, it's too bad it's so bright here, because it's, it's a pretty interesting picture. But it's, we see where Curiosity landed. And you can see a bit of blackening around this area. This is where the sky crane, it's the device with the rockets. The sky crane landed here, and it's black. This is where the parachute landed, the thing we just saw in the picture. And the heat shield that we got rid of early landed here. It's difficult to see. Maybe you can see with this bright light on it. But we landed here, and you can see this is a region of dark rocks. 
and at this point we only can go by color. This is a region of less dark rocks. The dividing line is here. And then this is a region of light colored rocks. Right here, these three different rock types come together. And we have spent the last three and a half months driving curiosity from here to here. And we're almost here where we will analyze the differences in these rocks. There's, there's nothing special about this except that we can see three different rock types in one place. The reason this is black is because the rockets blew away. You saw the dust when it was landing. The rocket engines blew all the dust off the surface. And I'll show you a picture of that in a moment. It's not because it was burned. Most of Mars is covered with a thin layer of dust, which is reddish. And so when you blow it away with a rocket engine, you can see what the rocks really look like. This was one of the first pictures that Curiosity took. It was fantastic to see. Um, I was in the mission control room when this came down. It was so exciting. This is Mount Sharp, this very high mountain. It's quite a distance away. You can see this blackened area here and here and here. This is where the rocket engines blew away the dust. And you can see the shadow of the rover. To give you an idea now, the rover's on the ground. To, to give you an idea how large it is, here's a comparison between the rover and a Mini Cooper. Normally we say that the rover is about the size of an American Jeep. So bigger than most of your cars here. And I appreciate why you have small cars after driving today, or, or, or riding. <laughs> This is a picture of the, the actual rover when it was being tested just before it was packaged to be launched. And you can see a couple of people here for scale. But it's got six large aluminum wheels. And it's got instruments on two different arms. Here's one arm, and here is another arm. And it also has instruments inside the body, which we call the laboratory. Right away, when the rover landed, when Curiosity landed, it began measuring the weather. It has a nice weather station on board. You can see it's, it's not a very hospitable place. This line shows the air temperature in Celsius. You can see at nighttime, it's about minus 70. And in the daytime, about close to zero, close to freezing temperature. So it's a, it's a cold place that's not particularly hospitable to life. This is the, what we would call on Earth the barometric pressure. The interesting thing about Mars is the pressure changes very much from day to night. It's not like Earth. We have a very large, about a 10% change in pressure from day to night, every day and every night. Even though the atmosphere on Mars is about 140 times thinner than on Earth. And it's mostly carbon dioxide, CO2. So now we're on Mars. The rover can begin to test all of its pieces. We tell it what to test. Whenever we want to try a new instrument, when we want to try the arm, it's a long process involving several days of testing. We test the rover on Earth, then we test it on Mars. So the reason the mission has gone now for over three months, and there are some instruments that have yet to be tested, is because it's a very long process. We want to make sure we don't break it. You don't want to be the guy who pushes the wrong button on, on this expensive mission. <clears throat> Just recently, we had enough tests to allow one of the arms to go all the way out with a camera on the end. It's kind of like you do sometimes with your cell phone, and you put it out and take a, a self-portrait with these beautiful mountains in the background. And 
I think my favorite picture it's taken so far is this incredible photograph of just the side of Mount Sharp. Mount Sharp is, is up there somewhere. But even if you are not a geologist, you can, I think, recognize the layers of rock here that normally on Earth we associated with sediments. So these have been deposited over time. And these dark regions are sand dunes. That's not exactly a true color, but these are sand dunes here. It's difficult to have a scale. It, it looks like a nice place for a hike to me. But to give you an idea of the scale, there is a dark spot right there, which is a boulder the size of a car. And so this is a very, very large scale picture. So for the next two years, Curiosity will drive amongst these canyons and, and mesas, studying these layers of rock. And naturally, we will begin at the bottom, which means we will begin with the oldest rocks, and we will get younger and younger. Keep in mind, as I said in the beginning, most of the rocks we see on Mars are very, very old. There are probably more than 3.6 billion years, which is older than, I think, almost any rock you can find on Earth. So I'm going to show you a couple of remarkable pictures. I've shown, the, shown these pictures to geologists, and they're very excited. If, hopefully, if you're not a geologist, you will also be excited. But as we drove from this darkened area, again, all the dust has been blown away, to a place some people call Link, another place. And this is this place where the three types of rocks go together. This is what we found very early. If you look at these rocks, it's unlike anything we have ever seen on Mars. It looks like a mixture of a lot of small rocks. And I'll show you a, a better picture of a different one. Later we found this rock, which is remarkably similar to things that we see on Earth in many, many places. We call this a conglomerate. It's made up of many small, smaller pieces. The important thing, it's exciting, yes? <laughs> the important thing about this rock is that it contains small pebbles that are round or rounded, which tells us something we never knew before on Mars, and that is that water has flowed on the surface of Mars and it has been flowing long enough to round the pebbles. So if you go to a stream in the mountains, you will find rounded pebbles. The stream has been flowing for many, many thousands of years. So it's, a, it's an incredibly geologically important story just in this rock. So there was a huge amount of excitement when we found this rock. And it's just a picture. Some of you may have heard recently that one of the instruments on Curiosity was examining the atmosphere. The, the instrument known as SAM, S-A-M, has the ability to analyze the Martian atmosphere and the isotopic composition of the atmosphere. And just about two weeks ago, it analyzed the atmosphere in search of methane. Methane is, is a very common gas on Earth. It's flammable. If you go to your local landfill where your trash, where your garbage is, is deposited, breakdown of organic materials will produce methane. Generally on Earth, methane is associated with biological activity or biological decay. So there was very much interest in whether or not methane occurred on Mars. And two previous studies from a distance said that there was a small amount of methane in the Mars atmosphere. You might say, fine. So what? The interesting thing about methane is that it breaks down, it, it decays in the Mars atmosphere very quickly. 
So if we find methane in the atmosphere, it tells us that there is actually methane being produced today. Methane can also be produced by other types of processes, volcanic and so on. It's an important result that the Curiosity rover found that they detected no methane. Many people were disappointed. But we shouldn't be disappointed. It's, it's as interesting as if we found a lot of, well, maybe not so interesting, but it would, may suggest life. But it's a, it's a good scientific result that we found no evidence of methane on Mars. It's an, a very, very sensitive instrument. Now, one of the things that many people ask me when they learned that I participated on this mission is what was it like working on the mission? I traveled from my home at the end of July. I live in Indiana, and I traveled to Pasadena, California, where the Jet Propul Propulsion Lab is located. And I stayed there for three months, and I didn't come to my home until last week, and four days later I came to Napoli. But it was a, a very exciting time. Every day there was something interesting. This is, for those of you who watched, I know many people I've talked to watched the landing on TV, and you saw a lot of guys in blue shirts in this, it was this room, and they were jumping up and down. So I worked right next to this. We saw the data immediately on all of these screens as they came down from Mars. A unique thing about this, and when the room is dark, this looks good, but it's pretty dark. This is what it looked like many times when I went to work, because we worked on Mars time, not Earth time. And the Mars day is 24 hours, 39 and a half minutes. So if I go to work today at 8 in the morning, in a couple of weeks, Mars time will get ahead. I will go to work at 8 in the evening. Another week later, I'm going to work at midnight, and so on. So we gradually cycled through. So very often, we went to work at, at midnight, or 1, or 2, or 3 in the morning, and we worked until 9 or 10 in the morning, and then we slept for a few hours, and then we did it again. So it was so exciting that we could do this for three months. And our team often looked like this, <laughs> because you could, after a month or two, you've, you couldn't take it anymore. This is what our, our instrument room looked like. So we all worked in a small room, communicating with the rover every day. So finally, near the end of our three months time, when we all stayed at, in Pasadena, <clears throat> we were preparing to put a sample into the instrument that I worked with. And so the first thing we could do was to, to dig a small scoop of what we called soil. You could call it a sand dune. And this is a sand dune. We first drove the rover into it to make sure it was soft because we didn't want to break the scoop on the first try. This is a picture of this sand dune, and there are many, many dunes. You could see them in the, in the picture as it was landing. Many dunes on the surface of Mars. It's a very windy place, and there are many times when the entire surface of Mars is invisible because of dust storms. And this, this dust is interesting because it actually has a global component. There's pieces in there from the whole planet that are circulated. They've been circulated for tens of thousands of years. And the larger components come from more local contributions. So we were able to obtain a sample. Pier Giulio gave me the, the Italian word for sieve. Setacciato, uh, less than 150 micrometers. So we dug into the dune, we obtained the scoop, and this material was then deposited after going through the sieve into our instrument for the purposes of determining mineralogy. And so again, I told you what mineralogy, it's what minerals are present. Why do we care about this? And 
really what does this mean? And I have an example to, to tell you what mineralogy means. Many times people analyze materials for their chemistry, so they determine the, chem the chemical composition. And I'm using as my example here things that you're probably all familiar with. Some of you would like to be more familiar with this diamond. This is graphite, the black material in your pencil. If we analyzed each one of these for chemistry, it would tell us that they contain carbon. So from chemistry, they're the same. That's not so interesting. If we used the technique known as X-ray diffraction, which is what the Chemin instrument uses, it would tell us something about the arrangement of the atoms in these two. And diamond and graphite have very different arrangements of atoms. And that's why they're so different in properties. You know that diamond is the hardest material that we know of. There is nothing that we know of that's harder. Graphite is one of the softest materials, and they're the same chemical composition. It's the arrangement of atoms that gives it those properties, and that's what we want to know about, because that can tell us all about the history of the rock. So geologists read the history of a planet through its minerals, because it's sensitive to the structure. So it's sensitive to temperature, whether or not water was present when it formed, if water was present, what composition, and so on. So it's very important. It's like our history book. We can read through the pages using mineralogy. So X-ray diffraction is a technique that some of you who are geologists are familiar with. If you're not familiar with it, it's, it's something that tells us the crystal structure. But a laboratory X-ray diffraction instrument is about this wide and about this tall and it weighs about 500 kilograms. Not the type of thing that you want to send to Mars. The, the tremendous innovation that we were able to make allowed us to reduce the size of this instrument to the size of a shoebox, something this big that you could carry in your hands. And it, we've also been able to adapt this these developments to use on Earth. And this, in, a, in this orange box, is the equivalent of this that you can carry out in the field with you and make X-ray diffraction measurements. So it's a very, very nice development. So there are really two things that allow us to do this. One is the kind of detector that we use. We use what is known as a CCD detector. If you don't know what that is, take out your cell phone and look at the camera. And the camera in your cell phone uses a CCD detector. It's also your, your small camera that you might have. We shine a beam of x-rays through a very thin sample onto the CCD, and it gives us these rings, which are essentially the fingerprint for each individual mineral present in the sample. If you have more than one mineral, it's like having two fingerprints on the glass. It's no problem. And from that, we get x-ray diffraction information. We also get chemical information. It's free. This is the second innovation, and you can see the sample moving. This is a sample in an 8 millimeter window between very thin plastic, and the sample itself moves. In the laboratory instrument, we move the instrument. In Kemen, we move the sample. So it allows us to make it much, much smaller. And this is what it looks like. So we're going to put a sample into Kemen. There it is in between the little window. It's filling, the sample is filling up between the thin window. We move it in front of the x-ray beam. We turn on the x-rays, and we're, the x-rays are hitting this, the powdered sample. The sample is moving, and we're recording the interaction between the x-ray beam and the sample on our CCD, giving us these rings that slowly develop. And this is probably the, the greatest piece of data I've ever measured in my life. And about two and a half weeks ago, we obtained this diffraction pattern, the first diffraction pattern from another planet. And I was able to be the, the person to interpret 
the first refraction pattern from another planet. It was a, an amazing day. Most of our instrument team stayed awake for at least 24 hours. We were so excited. We went home and we decided, let's not go to sleep, let's have a beer. It's just to celebrate. It was a, a great day. It's probably one of the, the best moments of my scientific career. And interestingly, measurement of this first set of diffraction data on another planet coincides with the 100th anniversary of the discovery of X-ray diffraction. It would be fun for the inventor, for the discoverer to know this. And for those of you who have ever done X-ray diffraction, we simply integrate around these rings to, to create our conventional X-ray diffraction pattern. Well, what did we find? We found something that was, in a way, it was not surprising, maybe in a way it was maybe not so exciting, except for the fact that it was on Mars. We found that the, this Martian dune, this sand dune that we analyzed, contained plagioclase feldspar. If you've never heard of feldspar, you should know about feldspar. It's by far the most common mineral in the Earth's crust. It's not quartz, it's feldspar, it's common. Contained pyroxenes, olivine, and about half of it is an amorphous or glassy kind of material. So a glassy material doesn't have this nice ordered arrangement of atoms. This material is consistent with the absence of water. So now we have the conglomerate that's consistent with flowing water for a long time. This is consistent with the absence of water. It's interesting that this material is really similar to basaltic soils that we've studied on the sides of Mauna Loa volcano in Hawaii. So it's a typical uh, unaltered basaltic soil. So just to try to summarize for you quickly, I mentioned that these, one says water, one says not. Remember that the conglomerates that strongly tell us that there was flowing water are several billion years old, at probably greater than 3.5 billion years old. This young soil in this dune is representative of modern processes on Mars, when we know that it's dry. The dunes are on the order of tens of thousands of years old, not billions of years old. And so our first results, and we're going to get many more in two years, are really perfectly consistent with our ideas of the evolution of the surface of Mars and the geology of Gale Crater, which we record a transition over a very large length of time from a, an early wet environment on Mars to a dry environment today. So, vi ringrazio molto per la vostra attenzione e sono felice di rispondere alla domanda. In English, for, for, for favore. <laughs> Riaccendiamo le luci. Se no, io non vedo chi vuol fare domande. Se non accendiamo le luci in sala. Se la vuole fare in italiano, io poi proviamo a tradurla in inglese, no, oppure preferisci in inglese? No, in English is in the in same. English. Thank you for your nice presentation, a very exciting field. I understand that your scientific interests are on mineralogy, rocks and minerals. But I have, I'm sorry, a biological question, because I'm sure that you have interacted with other scientists in the mission. And my question is, um, I was trying to figure out what would happen to our immune system if we will encounter uh, a completely different bacterial or viral scenario. Do you, think, do you think that this can be an issue? Is anybody planning uh, a strategy to define, uh, to identify new species, biological species? Grazie, grazie per l'inglese. A million dollar question, yes. 
Uh, it's true. It's a very interesting question, and many people have thought about this question for many years. Um, I think even science fiction writers have thought about this question, and it's very far, so far, from my area of expertise, but you can, you can speculate, we can all speculate. We, I can tell you that, first of all, if there is a concern about, um, for example, bacteria evolving under a very different environment, um, I think we can be confident it, that it would be very different. As we know, things evolve in response to the environment, and the environment is so different. We, we, will not, we are not bringing anything back. There is discussion uh, amongst NASA scientists about having a Mars sample return mission, which would bring samples back, in which case the samples would be treated more as biological samples than geological samples, and they would go to the same laboratories that study, for example, the Ebola virus. I can, I can tell you about that. But as far as speculating, I, I can only say that um, they would be, certainly if, if there's anything on Mars, it would have evolved in, in a very, very different uh, radiation environment, um, uh, oxidizing environment, and so, yeah, it's, you're right. It's very different from my, my field. <laughs> Hi. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Just a little question. Uh, uh, in one of your first slides, you show us um, an image with three kinds of soils. If I remember well, uh, it was a monochrome image with uh, three shades of gray representing uh, three different soils. Uh, I just wanted to know which one of these soils was analyzed by the uh, last light you showed us. Maybe you can, I will okay. move and you uh, can. Uh, ah, okay. yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you. This, so yes. the, the three different rock types, yes. Uh, uh, the question is, which one was okay, okay, thank so, you. <laughs> so you recall we have the light colored rock. This is mainly rock. We have the medium colored and then the dark. And this, the material that we analyzed was a, a sand dune on top of the, the dark rock. So we did not analyze yet the rock we only, so if you went to the Sahara Desert, you have sand on the top. We analyzed the loose, sandy material on the top, not the rock underneath. We, we have not received approval yet to use the drill. We have a drill, and then we will drill into these rocks. So, so, so far, we have not analyzed a rock. It's a good question. Thank you. Thanks a lot for your talk. It's really exciting and inspiring. My question is... Okay. <laughs> See, it's good. Uh, my question is, uh, are you working on a fixed budget? How many samples are you going to analyze? Are you deciding which samples to take, how many samples to take, or is uh, already fixed? It's a very good question. Um, we... The, the mission has approximately 400 scientists working, and so this guy wants to analyze this rock, and I want to analyze this rock, and she wants to analyze this rock. So there's a very big process for deciding, but our instrument, you saw there was a wheel that turned when we put the sample in. The wheel has 26 different sample chambers. The sample chamber can be loaded 
the wheel can be in, analyzed, the wheel can then be turned around and vibrated, and whoosh, the sample disappears, we can use again. So for our purposes, the Kemen instrument, the mineralogy instrument, essentially will last beyond the life of the mission. It would be wonderful if we used all of these. Most of the time, the, the Curiosity rover is doing more remote kinds of things. So it, it stands back and takes a picture. Or it, there's a, a little device that measures chemistry with a laser beam. It's very easy. We do that. So we seldom put a sample inside the rover, either the Kemen or the SAM instrument. So we will have plenty of space for all of the samples, but it's a mostly democratic process deciding what sample. We don't, as the instrument, Kemen instrument science team, we don't get to decide our, ourselves, unfortunately. <laughs> The, the whole mission cost about 2.4 billion dollars. So many people, we have had many discussions about, oh, it's a lot of money. That's pretty much, but... <laughs> But um, the important thing is that we began the mission in 2004, and the support, this $2.4 billion, is spread over about a 10 or 11 year time frame. It employs a lot of people, so it's still a lot of money. Um, one thing I like to say is that it costs less than the National Football League budget for one year. 240 million l'anno, che non è tantissimo di dollari. Can I ask you something? Where did, it, where did the water go? Where did the water go? Because, you know, nothing will disappear. There was water, now there is no water. Where did, where did it go? That, that's, we're pretty confident we know where it went. Uh, why it went is a better, a bigger, more important question, but it's another million dollar question you ask. The, most of the water, disappeared to, or went to, the, to space. There, there are several important differences on Mars. One is that the gravity is much weaker than ours, so its ability to hold an atmosphere is less. It also has no magnetic field. And you might say, what does that have to do with holding an atmosphere? But one of the biggest forces affecting an atmosphere is solar wind solar particles from the sun. So if you have a planet with a magnetic field, the solar particles come to your planet and are deflected. So it protects us against a lot of cosmic radiation and solar flares. So this, the radiation I showed you comes to Earth and goes like this. It has no magnetic field. The, the solar wind comes to Mars and blows the atmosphere. So over, over many billions of years, essentially it was blown into space. There is still a fair amount of water on the surface of Mars in the form of ice. See, on the poles, both the North and South Poles are white. Some of that is water ice. Some of it is carbon dioxide ice. It's cold enough that carbon dioxide freezes. But it's an excellent question. And, Something that many people have studied thinking about the future of Earth, because we have so much water. There used to be a lot of water on Mars. Can the same kind of thing happen? But it turns out, it's, I find it so intriguing that a magnetic field is a, a very important part. You said that uh, you were quite surprised about the presence of a lot of dust on the surface of the planet. Why? Oh, I, I hope I did not say I was surprised. Um, we, we know that the surf, I said maybe, you may be surprised. So there you, are, you were surprised. <laughs> now, we, we've known for many years that the surface of Mars is dusty and 
the, we have very nice images of Mars from the Hubble Space Telescope. Some days showing you can see features on the surface, mountains. You can see the canali. Other days you see nothing. It's just red with dust. The entire planet is covered by dust storms occasionally. So we know for a long time that Mars is a very dusty place. There are, it's probably at least several hundred micrometers on every surface, which, as you might imagine, if you're a geologist, it makes it very difficult to understand what's underneath the dust, because many of the methods we've used so far are sensitive just to the skin of the surface. So we learn, we look at a, a granite, there's no granite, we look at a basalt <coughs> with a spectroscopic method and we see dust, not granite, or not basalt, for example. Uh, there are, uh, uh, you find uh, uh, a lot of evidences about the presence of clay minerals on, uh, on Mars. And, but uh, in the data you, you showed, uh, uh, well, in the, the, this few forced analysis, uh, you didn't find minerals. Uh, mm, the, the explanation is related to the, the specific site you analyze, or there are some other questions? No, it's a very good question. We have seen evidence for clay minerals around the surface of Mars. And they are probably existing in those, those layers of rock that I showed you pictures of. The first, because the first sample we, sa we took with the scoop was a dust. It's essentially a picture of the entire global composition. And so over the global average of Mars, there's very little clay mineral in the dust. Probably there is some. But the detection limit is, is so high, it's a few few percent, that if there was, for example, one percent clay mineral, it would be in the, in the noise in the pattern. So, it's so a good, you are confident it's a in, in trying uh, some layer uh, yes. containing uh, more clay minerals? Yes, we, we look forward very much to using the drill on a sedimentary rock. Many people are excited to find other kinds of minerals like this. I'd like to know if there is uh, any active research about the gravitational field of Mars or about the electromagnetic properties of Mars. Can, can you repeat the middle part? <laughs> any active research about the geophysics of Mars? Geophysics. Ah, it's a great question. And many, many people wish that we had added a seismograph to curiosity. I wish. I'm a mineralogist, and I wish. Um, so only a very small amount of research because we have no seismic information. We know something about the magnetic field, as I mentioned. It's a very, very weak magnetic field um, today. There appears to have been a stronger one in the past, but very little geophysical research. It's something that you should if you're interested, you should propose to the European Space Agency. They're sending another mission uh, to Mars. And it's, it would be a very good thing to know more about. If there's any tectonic, meaning any movement of, the, of Mars. Good. Allora, l'ultima, ragazzi. Le, dai, le ultime due che siete. Tu e lui. E poi andiamo. David, do you have any idea about uh, any volatile content in glass? Any idea about what? The, about the, the content of volatiles in, in, in the glass portion. In the glass. Oh, gases. Gases in the glass. No. Um, yes, actually. <laughs> Just recently. And the, I mentioned the SAM instrument. The SAM instrument is able to analyze atmospheric gases, so it can take a sample of atmosphere and, and analyze this by a, a gas chromatograph and a mass spectrometer. 
It also has the ability to take a solid sample and heat it and examine the evolved gases. And I must admit, it did this while I was here. So I know that it's doing it, but I don't know the results. And I think they have a press conference, maybe today, <laughs> uh, on this subject. So yes, the, the instrument can definitely tell about volatiles in minerals and glasses. Yes, it will be very interesting also for us to know about this. It will help us with the mineralogy. Allora, l'ultima. Non diamo la parola al professor Morra perché sono sta qui a parlare per circa mezz'ora. Uh, we really know that uh, Curiosity is actually looking for life on, uh, on Mars now. This is the, the first goal of Curiosity. So what we're looking for is actually small traces of uh, whatever it may be. So do you think, like, connected to, to Kemin, do you think that, that the small traces of some kind of mineral which may be connected to life can be in somehow missed during the analysis, analysis of these samples due to sample preparation? As, as I understand, I believe you asked about Kemen in analysis. Kemen or whatever, yes, yes. Uh, another analysis. So we, we are talking about uh, uh, detection levels here, Same. connected with, with sample preparation. It is, it, is it possible to miss some of the life traces it, just because you miss uh, uh, the right preparation for the sample? I believe it's, it's possible to miss because the, uh, particularly for Kemen, because minerals that are suggestive of life are, are very rare and usually ambiguous. Although we are particularly interested in looking for salt minerals that often contain in, um, inside them the remnants of life and also clay minerals. So we can easily identify those. The, the job of identifying traces of life will go to the, the SAM instrument and that's why it has a gas chromatograph and a mass spectrometer to allow it to look at, look for organic compounds that are suggestive of traces of life. And it's, for example, its detection limit for methane is approximately two parts per billion. So it's a very, very sensitive instrument. It's, it's as good as, as most instruments on Earth. That's the instrument that will tell us yes or no and, and fo follow what they do over the coming months and years. Um, one, just one quick comment from, from Pier Giulio. Oh, okay. If there, if there are any, are there any school children remaining in the yeah, audience? No, they are university students. See? I'm a school children. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're, so ask, please ask in, in Italian. Ci sono ragazzi delle scuole o soltanto dell'università qua? I see some in the back. Yes. Qualcuno I, là dietro. I, I have some, some stickers from my instrument for you to take, if you like. Ho professori da portare a scuola. No, no, tu ragazzi, dai. No. <laughs> hey, did you understand why I said I'm a Sì, 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 I understand. Ok, allora ringraziamo David veramente perché è stata una grandissima, è di, di grandissimo interesse quello che ci ha detto. Poi vorrei cogliere l'occasione per regalargli due cose pesantissime che pesano più del, 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 del Kemin, eh, che è un libro, il libro del, del Reale Orto Botanico di Napoli, David. Can we give oh, it to you? This, it's beautiful. These are the drawing, original drawings yes. that were made by you know, the, the, our bot, uh, botanist when they started, you know, when you open it. Beautiful. Uh, don't open it. Okay, don't open it. And then this other little book which is heavy, also. so we have to send it to the States, eh? which is the old mm. books that we've got at the university. Thanks a lot, David. Thank you. Thank you. Sir.